Prostate Cancer In this video podcast, we will discuss important clinical principles regarding prostate cancer. The presentation objectives are organized into the five W's of prostate cancer that you should remember. Who develops prostate cancer? When does prostate cancer show up? Where does prostate cancer develop? What do patients with prostate cancer present with? Why should we screen or not screen for prostate cancer? Finally, we will discuss how we diagnose and manage patients with prostate cancer. First, let's talk about who develops prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is the most common cancer in males in Canada and accounts for approximately 21% of new cancer diagnosis in Canadian males. One in seven males will develop prostate cancer in their lifetime. The greatest risk factor for prostate cancer is age. One in eight males between the ages of 60 and 80 will have prostate cancer, and the risk continues to increase with age. Another risk factor is genetics. People with a family history of prostate cancer are at an increased risk. Ethnicity and geography also appear to play a role, although our understanding of this is incomplete. Prostate cancer is more common in African Americans, and although Asian Americans have a lower risk of prostate cancer than Caucasian Americans, they still have a higher risk than people of similar descent living in Asia. Other factors that may increase the risk of prostate cancer are diets high in red meat and saturated fat, or low in vegetables, as well as cigarette smoking. When does prostate cancer show up? The risk of prostate cancer increases with age. Over 90% of those diagnosed with prostate cancer are over the age of 60. The median age of diagnosis is 72. Where does prostate cancer develop? The prostate is a gland about the size of a walnut that is part of the male reproductive system. It sits below the bladder and anterior to the rectum and surrounds the prostatic urethra. The prostate can be divided into four zones. The central zone, which surrounds the ejaculatory ducts. The transitional zone, which surrounds the prostatic urethra. The peripheral zone, which is posterior and easily palpable on digital rectal exam. And the anterior fibromuscular stroma, which contains no glandular tissue. Much of the prostate is covered by a connective tissue capsule. 75% of prostate cancers develop in the peripheral zone while 20% and 5% occur in the transitional and central zones, respectively. The most common type of prostate cancer is prostate adenocarcinoma, which is a cancer of glandular epithelium within the prostate. There are other, rarer types of prostate cancer, including other epithelial and non-epithelial tumors. What do patients with prostate cancer present with? Early prostate cancer is usually asymptomatic. As a result, most prostate cancer is found on screening. When symptomatic, the signs and symptoms of prostate cancer can mirror the three ways that prostate cancer can spread, as explained in the podcast on mechanisms of cancer spread. Local symptoms can include urinary obstruction or bleeding in the form of hematuria, hematospermia, or hematochesia. It is important to note that urinary obstruction can also be caused by benign prostatic hypertrophy, which is a non-cancerous enlargement of the prostate with age, and that other conditions can also cause bleeding from the urethra or rectum. When prostate cancers spread distantly or hematogenously, the most common site is bone. As such, patients may present with bone pain. Why should we screen or not screen for prostate cancer? Screening for prostate cancer is a controversial topic. Screening methods such as the prostate-specific antigen or PSA testing and digital rectal exams are widely used, but many groups discourage population-wide screening for prostate cancer, particularly using PSA testing in asymptomatic males. To understand why, it is important to first recognize while the lifetime risk of developing prostate cancer is 14% in males, or 1 in 7, the lifetime risk of death from prostate cancer 
is 2.6%, or 1 in 39. This is because in many cases, people have slow-growing prostate cancers that will not ultimately cause illness or death, and there is no test that can determine which cancers will eventually become clinically significant. Additionally, there is inconsistent evidence about whether screening for prostate cancer decreases the risk of death from prostate cancer. As a result of this controversy, guidelines for screening vary by jurisdiction. Potential benefits of screening using PSA testing include early detection of prostate cancer, but not necessarily reduction in mortality from prostate cancer. Additionally, PSA is relatively low cost and more sensitive and specific than a digital rectal exam alone. Potential harms of screening using PSA testing include the risk of false positives leading to unnecessary prostate biopsy, and the risk of overdiagnosis leading to unnecessary intervention for cancers that would not become clinically significant, as well as adverse effects and complications of those interventions, such as erectile dysfunction and urinary incontinence. Additionally, there can be false negatives from PSA testing. After a discussion of the benefits and harms of screening, those who wish to pursue screening for early detection of prostate cancer could be offered an annual digital rectal exam and be made aware of the PSA test as a screen. The age at which this could start varies by jurisdiction, but generally around 50 to 55 is reasonable. How are patients with prostate cancer diagnosed and managed? In order to understand how to diagnose, stage, and manage patients with prostate cancer, it is useful to first think in terms of how prostate cancer spreads. Prostate cancer can spread by direct, lymphatic, or hematogenous spread. Prostate cancer can spread directly by going through thin areas of the prostate capsule to surrounding structures including the bladder neck, the seminal vesicles, the insertion of the ejaculatory duct, and to the bladder or bowel. It can also spread lymphatically to nearby lymph nodes. Finally, prostate cancer can spread hematogenously. The most common sites for distant metastases from prostate cancer is the bone, and it can also rarely involve the lung and liver. In a patient with suspected prostate cancer, the diagnostic evaluation should include a history, physical examination, blood work or imaging if indicated, and a biopsy of the prostate. A history should explore any previous screening the patient has had, including PSA testing or digital rectal examination, as well as any history of positive findings or biopsy. One should ask about any possible symptoms relating to prostate cancer or its spread, including urinary obstruction, sexual dysfunction, bleeding, and any bone pain. A physical examination should include a digital rectal examination for any nodules, enlargement, or hardened areas. While the inguinal nodes could be palpated, they are rarely involved. One should also examine the external genitalia. One can also examine the skeleton and abdomen for any signs of metastatic disease as applicable. Blood work, such as PSA testing, may be useful as an aid to the diagnosis of prostate cancer. This is distinct from its role in screening, which we have discussed. Other blood work that may be indicated includes a complete blood count for anemia or bone marrow dysfunction, electrolytes and creatinine for kidney function, liver function tests, and calcium or alkaline phosphatase for any bone metastases. Imaging, such as a bone scan, CT, or MRI, may also be used to look for distant metastases as applicable. Biopsy is the gold standard for the diagnosis of prostate cancer and typically involves obtaining multiple core needle biopsies under the guidance of a transrectal ultrasound, or TRUS. Multiple cores are taken from any visualized lesions and other regions in the prostate. These are then analyzed pathologically to determine a Gleason score. In determining the Gleason score, each core is analyzed and given a grade from 1 to 5, with 1 being normal and increasing numbers reflecting increasing dysplasia. The Gleason score is determined by adding the primary, or most common grade, to the secondary, or second most common grade, for a total out of 10. 
It should be noted that a Gleason score of 7 is worse with a grade 4 primary and a secondary grade 3 pattern than the same score with a grade 3 primary and a secondary grade 4 pattern. Once the diagnosis of prostate cancer is made, the cancer should be staged using the TNM classification system. The tumor, or T stage, can be determined on the basis of a biopsy or a prostatectomy specimen if applicable. The nodal stage, or N stage, can be determined based on the CT scan for intra-abdominal lymph nodes or lymph node dissection if applicable. The metastases, or M stage, can be determined based on a bone scan to look for bone metastases if applicable. The TNM classification, Gleason score, and PSA can thereafter be used to group prostate cancers into low, intermediate, or high-risk groups. Refer to the prostate cancer module for more details. Treatment options for prostate cancer vary based on the stage and the risk grouping of the disease. A complete discussion of all treatment options is outside the context of this video and can be explored in our module on prostate cancer. In general, as many elderly patients develop prostate cancer, and prostate cancers can present very early, treatment needs to be balanced to consider patient, tumor, and treatment factors. For early prostate cancers, treatment approaches can include active surveillance, which involves serial PSAs, physical exams, and digital rectal examinations, and rebiopsy when indicated, surgery, or radiation therapy. For more advanced prostate cancers, androgen deprivation therapy may be combined with surgery and radiation in either a neoadjuvant or adjuvant setting. Options for metastatic prostate cancer are continually increasing. They can include radiation, androgen deprivation therapy, and systemic therapies. Following treatment for prostate cancer with curative intent, the PSA may be used in follow-up to monitor for recurrence of prostate cancer. After a radical prostatectomy, the PSA should be undetectable or at least very low. Alternatively, rising PSA levels following treatment such as radiotherapy, can suggest recurrent disease, which can be local or metastatic. There are many definitions of a PSA relapse. Please refer to our module for further details. This concludes our short introduction to the five W's of prostate cancer. For further information, you can refer to the prostate cancer module on learnoncology.ca. Thank you.